Hi, we're the junior docents of Los Serenos to Point Vicente, and we're here to premiere the third season of Peninsula Profile, an educational series on the natural and cultural aspects of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. From this series, we're here to present our episode on the blue and gray whales' presence in our coastal area. Peninsula Profile is produced by Los Serenos de Point Vicente and RPV TV. For more information on Los Serenos de Point Vicente, go to losserenos.org or find us on Facebook at Los Serenos. Now enjoy the show! There are two types of whales, baleen and tooth. As its name suggests, the toothed whale is characterized by having teeth. The baleen whale, on the other hand, is characterized by having baleen plates, which are keratin bristles used to filter food. This segment focuses on two species of baleen whales that can be observed from the Palos Verdes Peninsula, the Pacific Gray Whale and the Blue Whale. The Blue Whale is known to be the largest animal that roams the planet, which can reach lengths up to 105 feet. In comparison to the African elephant, which is the largest land animal, the blue whale is almost eight times the elephant's size. The bronchiosaurus, known to be one of the largest dinosaurs of its time, is only about one-third to a half of the blue whale's length. Like the Pacific gray whale, though not nearly as common, this enormous animal can be seen traveling up and down the coast of Palos Verdes. The Point Vicente Interpretive Center, whose whale watching site overlooks common whale passing waters, celebrates the rare occasion of catching a glimpse of a blue whale. But what has really fascinated most people about these creatures, other than the spectacle of a whale fluking, is the lifestyle that the blue whale has known to uphold and the enormous lengths it must go to survive. Blue whales can be found in all of the Earth's major oceans. They usually travel alone, though it is not unusual to see them swimming in pairs. During the summer, they often feed in cooler, polar waters, and then migrate down towards the equator in the winter, taking advantage of the warm climate. To communicate with one another, they release a series of pulses, groans, and moans that echo through the water. Known also as one of the loudest animals on the planet, these communicative signals are said to reach up to 1,000 miles in traveling length. Though similar, this method is not to be confused with sonar communication, which is used by creatures such as the dolphin. Scientists believe that the whale's incredible sound is used as a way for the animal to navigate the lightless ocean depths. When a baby blue whale is born, it can reach almost 25 feet in length and weigh up to 3 tons. They are born in the late winter and early spring in warm waters and are called calves. Surprisingly though, scientists have never actually been able to observe a whale birth and can only assume that they give birth in certain parts of the world. For the first year of its life, the calf only consumes milk from its mother, gaining up to 200 pounds a day. During this time, the baby whale almost never leaves the mother's side. The mother and calf only separate after about a year, when the calf is about 45 to 50 feet long. From here, the calf is left to survive on its own. The blue whale is also known to have one of the longest lifespans of any creature averaging from about 80 to 90 years. The oldest blue whale on record has lived a shocking 110 years. Due to their obvious size, the blue whale has few predators that can threaten it. Among those few though, include sharks and killer whales, which will often take advantage of a blue whale traveling alone in the water to encircle and attack a young or sick animal. But by far, the blue whale's most threatening predators are humans. Due to aggressive hunting in the early 1900s, humans ruthlessly hunted the blue whale for their oil, bones, and meat, pushing them almost to extinction. In that same time period, it is said that some 360,000 blue whales were killed. This slaughter eventually put the animal under the protection of the International Whaling Commission in 1966. Though the effort seemed at the time a relief, the whales have yet to make a serious recovery in their population. Today, humans threaten the blue whale through the presence of large ships that sail the oceans, which occasionally collide with the mass of animals. Blue whales are now classified as endangered on the World Conservation Union Red List. There are between 10,000 and 25,000 blue whales left 
on Earth. The Point Vicente Interpretive Center, though its main dedication is to the gray whale, emphasizes and promotes the blue whale's presence in our oceans, especially in the waters located just off our peninsula. The Interpretive Center carries diagrams, books, as well as real-life specimens that enable guests to learn more about the blue whale and their interaction to other creatures in the ocean. With knowledgeable docents and an active whale-watching site at hand, the Point Vicente Interpretive Center proves to be one of the best locations to learn about the blue whale on our peninsula. Growing up to 50 feet long and weighing a staggering 80,000 pounds, the Eastern Pacific Gray Whale inherently inspires awe in anyone who has the privilege of catching a glimpse of them during their migration along the coast. Due to the Pacific Gray Whale's annual migration, along the Palos Verdes Peninsula. The residents here take pride in the existence of these impressive creatures and their natural rituals. However, there is much more to the gray whale than what is observable from the convenience of the Point Vicente Interpretive Center. Beneath the surface of the ocean, they live remarkable yet mysterious lives, and it is this mystique that has piqued the curiosity of scientists, researchers, and marine mammal enthusiasts for many years. Surprisingly, the gray whale can reach speeds of up to 11 miles per hour. But how can such a large animal navigate so gracefully through the water? Unlike some whales, the gray whale is equipped with a dorsal hump rather than a dorsal fin, and 8 to 14 small bumps called knuckles between its dorsal hump and 15 foot wide tail flukes. Its flippers are broad but have pointed tips for easier steering. It is this sleek design that makes it possible for the whale to move seamlessly through the sea. One might also wonder why, although gray whales are born dark gray, their bodies become a mottled, lighter shade of gray as they age. This is due to the natural accumulation of barnacles and whale lice on their bodies. On average, the gray whale becomes sexually mature at 8 years old. Its gestation period is 12 to 13 months, and females typically give birth to one calf every other year. Newborn gray whales, also called pickles, due to the dimples on their skin, can reach from 12 to 15 feet long and weigh roughly 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. A baby gray whale is dependent on nourishment from its mother for seven to nine months, drinking an estimated 50 gallons of its mother's milk each day as it grows a thick layer of blubber for the northward migration to colder waters. Unlike humans' 2% fat milk, whale milk is extremely rich, about 53% fat. This concentration of fat helps the pickles gain weight faster. The lifespan of gray whales is unknown, but one tracked female gray whale was estimated at 80 years old. Unlike other species of baleen whales, gray whales are bottom feeders. This means that they feed by swimming to the bottom of the ocean, sucking up sediment, and filtering out benthic amphipods through their set of 130 to 180 baleen plates. The whale population familiar to the residents of the Palos Verdes Peninsula is called the Eastern Pacific Stock. Even though gray whales typically travel alone or in small groups, they tend to form groups on feeding and breeding grounds. This particular population spends the summer feeding in the northern Bering and Chukchi Seas. In the fall, the whales migrate south toward Baja, California to ultimately spend the winter there to breed and give birth. Round trip, these astounding creatures can cover from 12,000 to 14,000 miles, making their migration one of the longest of any mammal on the planet. It is during this great migratory ritual that we are able to observe these whales swimming along the Palos Verdes coast. Today, it is estimated that the Eastern Pacific stock consists of 20,000 whales, an amazing statistic considering that they were on the brink of extinction just 80 years ago. One might wonder what kind of predator could be vicious enough to cause the population of the magnificent gray whale to dwindle. Simply put, the gray whale's number one threat was man, specifically whalers. Men began hunting gray whales in the late 19th century and nearly depleted the population to the point where the practice of whaling was no longer profitable. However, during the early 20th century, their numbers began to recover, and whale hunting once again became a popular practice. Needless to say, 
the whalers nearly depleted the population for a second time. Consequently, in 1946, an international agreement to stop hunting these gentle giants was put in place. Ever since the initiation of this ban, the population has grown exponentially, as evidenced by its removal from the endangered species list in 1994. As junior docents at the Point Vicente Interpretive Center, we aim to educate the public about the importance of these animals by explaining their role in the biosphere and how it relates to the survival of humans. This center also contains exhibits such as the interactive gray whale and life-size gray whale calf model and is the primary station for the gray whale census in the Los Angeles area. All the docents working in the museum make it their priority to emphasize the significance behind protecting and respecting the gray whale and all marine life on Earth. In order to protect these animals today, humans must take measures to protect the gray whale's habitats from degradation and continue to enforce laws against whaling in the future. Hi, we're junior docents from Los Serenos de Point Vicente, and we're here to introduce the third season of Peninsula Profile, an educational series on the natural and cultural history of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. From this series, we're here to present our episode on the history of Japanese settlements on the peninsula. The Los Serenos junior docents produced this series in collaboration with the Francho Palos Verdes educational channel, RPV TV, and the RPVTV high school interns. For more information on becoming a Los Serenos docent, go to losserenos.org or find us on Facebook at Los Serenos. Now enjoy the show. Over the years, the Japanese farmers on the Palos Verdes Peninsula have been instrumental in shaping the history and culture of the peninsula. These farmers grew delicious crops and sold them to their loyal customers in their roadside produce stands. However, this refined process of farming, harvesting, and selling their local crops did not come easily for the Japanese farmers. The next segment will recount their struggles, obstacles, and eventual successes and show how the famed Japanese farming families of the peninsula came to be. The Meiji Restoration changed Japan's social structure from a traditional feudal system to a modern westernized system of private property ownership. Oftentimes, the heavy tax burden placed on property owners forced them to sell their land and move abroad in order to make money that they could send back home to support their families. The earliest Japanese immigrants settled in Hawaii and worked on numerous sugar plantations. Following the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, Japanese immigrants eagerly assumed the role of Chinese in American society. Large industrial companies sought these immigrants to replace workers lost to the Exclusion Act. Thousands of Japanese flocked to Hawaii and the mainland, particularly the West Coast. They arrived in cities such as Seattle and San Francisco, seeking the plentiful job opportunities offered to their people. In order to maintain their cultural heritage, those who came to the U.S. lived together in communities such as Neomachi in Seattle and Japantown in San Francisco. However, with the rapid introduction of new ethnic groups to the United States, came the inevitable conflict of racial discrimination. The earliest Japanese in the South Bay were fishermen who settled at White Point in San Pedro in 1887. Around the turn of the 20th century, Harry Phillips, the ranch manager for Jotham Bixby, the owner of the peninsula at the time, suggested that he transform the peninsula from a cattle ranch into a plantation. Phillips then invited Japanese farmers to farm the land with their unique techniques to make the sloped land more profitable. At the time, the alien land law prohibited all immigrants from becoming landowners, but Harry Phillips leased the Bixby land to the farmers for $10 an acre. Soon thereafter, over 40 families were farming roughly 1,900 acres of land on the south side of the peninsula. This land, although heavily peppered with rocks and boulders, was unusually fertile and produced some of the best tasting crops around. Farmers grew sugar beets, cabbage, string beans, tomatoes, cucumbers, and garbanzo beans. Garbanzo beans became one of the staple crops of the peninsula. 
They eventually became so popular that they were sold not only locally, but also internationally. The most notable of these farming families is the Ishibashi family. Kumikichi and Tamizu Ishibashi were two brothers who immigrated to the U.S. from Japan. Like many other immigrants, the two brothers entered the U.S. through San Francisco in 1910. After working for three years to save up enough money, they headed south to Palos Verdes in 1913. In the same year, California's government passed the California Alien Land Law, which prohibited all Asian immigrants from owning land or property, but permitted three-year leases. Earlier in 1913, Frank Vanderlip acquired the entire peninsula from Jotham Bixby and established the Vanderlip Corporation, which leased land to the Japanese farmers. Because they could not own land at this time, the Ishibashis leased 60 acres of land near Portuguese Bend from the Vanderlip Corporation. In the consequent years, the Ishibashi family would prove to be the most storied Japanese farming family in the South Bay. In 1915, Japanese farmers in the South Bay organized into the San Pedro Farmers Association. The Ishibashi brothers were very active members of the association. Kumikichi served as a treasurer until 1923, then his brother Tamizo held the position for 17 years until 1940. The farmers of this association sold their produce at the Los Angeles Wholesale Market. During the Second World War, many Japanese American people faced hardship and turmoil in Palos Verdes due to the alliance of Japan against the opposing forces of America. On December 8, 1941, the president of the San Pedro Vegetable Marketing Cooperative, Japanese American, Hideo Teganaga promised the entire crop of PV to the United States in the attempt to aid the war effort. This increased the workload of Japanese farmers in Palos Verdes by 75%. Despite recycling materials and products that helped produce crops, Japanese farmers in PV continued to double their efforts in farming. Ten days after the announcement, nine Japanese subs started attacking West Coast shipping lanes from San Diego to Seattle. This caused much tension in the area and was met with a demand to cut working hours when it got dark to shield lights from the coast, which made it harder to grow a steady crop. In 1942, the United States government demanded that everyone living in America with Japanese ancestry give up any recording devices in their possession. This only raised tension and made it difficult to conform to the rules set upon people with Japanese heritage. In the end, the Palos Verdes police station collected 14 cameras and 12 radios from Japanese American people in PV. During the war, many people speculated Japanese American responsibilities and whether or not they should remain farming in Palos Verdes. On January 16th, a PV news editorial stated that Japanese farmers are cultivating the land immediately adjoining the ocean and military objectives. It goes on to say that military telephone wires are laid all along the roads and through the Japanese farms and past their homes without guards anywhere. Right off the coast of Point Vicente, on January 28th, an army plane sighted Japanese submarines scouting the edges of Palos Verdes. Alarms were raised and the community was in a frenzy. Luckily, the alarm sirens and army scouts in the area drove them away. At the time, there was a large population of Japanese American farmers in Palos Verdes that helped grow crops that were used in the war effort. On February 1st, there was an extension granted for about 15 to 30 days for Japanese families to salvage pea and celery crops. And seven days later, Japanese homes were raided near Fort MacArthur. The city of Palos Verdes held public meetings to determine if there ought to segregate the Japanese American farmers. On February 13th, A. E. Hansen, a founding member of Rolling Hills, cancels leases for 40 Japanese people just east of Point Vicente on 500 acres. Crops and other provisions provided by Japanese Americans in the vicinity were dropped, more than 30%, and other citizens were needed to provide and house the people that were displaced. This was considered to be one of the hardest times for PV without Japanese American people providing crops. The hardships continued when the order was given for all people with Japanese ancestry to move into internment camps, for the time being until World War II was over. Unfortunately, most of the other Japanese American farming families 
did not return to the peninsula. Among the few who did were the Ishibashi family members. Along with six other families that returned, the farmers continued work on their farms after the war was over. After World War II, when the Japanese were released from American internment camps, the Ishibashi family decided to return to their beautiful homeland on the peninsula. They leased 500 acres of land and reestablished their ranch along Portuguese Bend. A ranch house was built on the property in 1952, but Kumikichi passed away shortly after in 1954. Tomizo Ishibashi had four sons, James, Tom, Ichiro, and Daniel, and two daughters, Yukiko and Naomi. However, only James and Tom continued in their father's footsteps. James's farm was located several miles down from his family's ranch. Together with his wife Annie, he operated the farm with the help of a few workers and grew crops such as strawberries, squash, tomatoes, and flowers. In 1978, the stand was renamed Annie Stand after James Ishibashi and Los Angeles County settled on a lease agreement. Annie Stand, with its trademark slogan, Deliciously Yours, became a huge hit with Palos Verdes residents shortly after it opened. Locals praised the stand for its fresh bouquets of sweet peas and daffodils, as well as its sweet long-stemmed strawberries, juicy tomatoes, and green peas. On the other side of the hill, Tom established his own farm next to what is now the Torrance Municipal Airport. The small Torrance farm also had a stand from which to sell its crops. Like his brother James, Tom sold flowers and vegetables, but he was most known for his strawberries. The strawberries, as well as other fresh produce, helped Tom earn an outstanding reputation in the South Bay and a loyal group of patrons. In 1977, James and Annie Shibashi were forced by Mercury Enterprises to move their beloved stand in order to make room for a commercial townhome community. The couple was given a 30-day grace period to find a new location, but even after they found one, their situation did not improve. Annie, who was lovingly known as the Flower Lady, passed away in 1992. Despite her death, James and the rest of the Ishibashi family kept Annie stand in business until 2002, when James died at the age of 83. The closing of Annie stand marked the beginning of the end of Japanese farming on the peninsula. In 2005, the Hotano family, the last Japanese farming family on the peninsula, tried to revive the historic landmark. Their plan ultimately failed and the stand closed for the final time just a year later in 2006. Then, in 2011, Tom was the last of the Ishibashi families to pass away. His family tried to maintain the farm after he passed on, but they knew that they had neither the energy nor the will to keep the farm running. In March of 2012, Tom's farm and produce stand made its last sale. Today, James Hatano is the last Japanese farmer remaining on the peninsula. He farms prickly pear cacti on his farm across the street from the Terranera Resort. James proudly embodies all of the history and tradition that the Japanese farmers on the peninsula have built over the last century. We are the Los Serenos de Point Vicente Junior Docents from the Point Vicente Interpretive Center in Rancho Palos Verdes. We are here today to introduce the Series 4 segment, The Blue Butterfly, as a part of the continuing exciting nature program, The Peninsula Profile. The Peninsula Profile covers aspects of the culture, history, and wildlife on the peninsula. The program is based on scripts developed by the junior docents themselves. The junior docents produced this series in collaboration with the Rancho Palos Verdes educational channel, RPVTV, RPVTV High School interns, and the Palos Verdes High School animation class. Now, now enjoy, enjoy the, the program. program. As a treasure unique to the coast, the Palos Verdes Blue Butterfly is anonymous to most residents of the Palos Verdes region. Though these butterflies are scarce in numbers, their unique appearance has earned them recognizable identification as well as a critical acclaim for their beauty and splendor. The luminescent wings of the PV Blue Butterfly span between 25 and 30 millimeters, around an incandescently colored blue body. The female's wings consist of a slur of brown and gray fabrics and a sapphire tint. The male dorsal wing is a shining amalgamation of blue and silver and is bordered in a black lining. This butterfly was considered to be specific to one species of plant for feeding, otherwise known as monophages. It was thought that the PV blue butterfly was particular to the loca weed, 
also known as the rattle pod. However, when the butterfly was rediscovered in 1994, they were revealed to be among the deerweed to supply its larva. Unfortunately, renovations and housing development have led these plants to become atypical in the area. If these larval plants are exterminated, the Palos Verdes blue butterfly will remain within the limits of the endangered species list. In the late winter and early spring, when the Palos Verdes blue butterfly males are sexually mature, they leave in search of females with whom to mate. After mating, the females search for plants on which to lay their eggs. Just as many other moths and butterflies, the Palos Verdes blue butterfly is generally restricted to a single host plant. In other words, the butterfly depends on the many key elements that the host plant naturally provides. In the case of the PV blue, host plants include loco weed and deer weed, commonly found on the southernmost parts of the Palos Verdes Peninsula, or have been reintroduced to the area. The larvae of the blue butterfly are adapted to the specific equilibrium of nutritional components that the plant offers. About three to five days after being laid, the larvae begin to feed on the flowers and their seeds, molting several times over in the process. The developmental stage of an arthropod between molts is called instar. As the larvae grow, they form somewhat of a symbiotic relationship with another local insect, carpenter ants. These ants protect the larvae against harmful larval parasites. In return, the larvae provide the ants with nutritive rewards such as sugars and amino acids. After a certain period of time, the larvae either drop to the ground or remain within the seed pods and pupate. From here, throughout the summer and fall, the pupae undergo several transformations until they finally emerge adult butterflies in the following spring. The Palos Verdes blue butterfly produces one generation per year. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed the Palos Verdes blue butterfly in 1980 as an endangered species. For a decade, the butterfly was not even seen anywhere on the peninsula and therefore was considered extinct. Possible factors for their disappearance include pressure of urban development, the decline of host plants in the habitat, weed control, off-road vehicle use, and invasions of non-native plants as dry areas. However, in 1994, Dr. Rudy Matoni, a professor at UCLA, discovered a small population persisting at the Defense Fuel Support Point in San Pedro. From 1994 until 2001, Dr. Matoni and his team worked a captive breeding, restoration, and monitoring program at the site where the butterfly was found. This project, administered by the UCLA Department of Geography and later the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy, also led the restoration of habitat and reintroduction of the species at the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy Chandler Preserve. The butterfly's success at this location, on the other hand, is uncertain. In 2002, Dr. Matoni continued the rearing program with the Urban Wildlands Group, though the responsibility soon switched into the hands of Moorpark College professor Jana Johnson. Other rearing sites include the Exotic Animal Training and Management Program Zoo at Moorpark College, where students of the school tended to the larvae and captive adults. As of 2008, the Palos Verdes blue butterfly population in the wild reached around 300 individuals. In the following year, the captive bred butterflies were released at the Defense Fuel Support Point in San Pedro, as well as at the Lyndon H. Chandler Preserve. In 2010, even more butterflies were released at the Dean Dana Friendship Park in San Pedro. This habitat will be maintained through the safe harbor agreement between the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the county. Over the years, the Palos Verdes blue butterfly has grabbed the attention of some of the most well-known news broadcasts and local and national publications such as the Daily Breeze. The butterfly has also been the subject of many science and natural life lessons of our local elementary, middle, and high schools. Offering even more coverage, the Point Vicente Interpretive Center, located by the Point Vicente Lighthouse, provides the public with detailed information regarding the Palos Verdes blue butterfly and its history. To learn more about the Point Vicente Interpretive Center, please call 310-377-5370. Find us on the web at losarinos.org or follow us on Facebook.